Welcome to the first series of Conversation on Value, a podcast on traces and dreams about reframing value in business and society. I'm Valeria Maltoni and I've been working on the question of value for more than 20 years. Good communication conveys a message clearly. Surprise helps it stick. But there is a little bit more to it than that. In this episode of Conversation on Value, Nick and I will talk about what it means to have a tone of voice and to explain things. Nick Parker was once a creative director and a writer. He's been a writer and editor for a decade at the Oldie magazine. He's also worked as a cartoonist at The Wiz and a joke writer for the radio. Nick says that a business is one of the greatest problem solving tools humanity has ever invented. He also says that communication is a dance between clarity and surprise. Conversation on Value is a podcast about how to reframe value in business and society. I'm Valeria and I've been working on the question of value for more than 20 years. So, Nick, we talked about um, tone of voice and, um, and explaining things. And the two things are related, right, to the work that you're doing right now. Do you want to tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, where should I start? Um, <laughs> they, weirdly, they're, they're separate and interrelated. So, uh, I'm a writer. A lot of the work I do... Uh, is around helping brands. Like my official spiel is that I help brands find their voice, tell their stories, and explain their things. Uh, and my company is called That Explains Things. And for a long time, I did sort of think of them as separate. You know, you're finding a voice is a very kind of brand intangible sort of thing about capturing the spirit of a brand in its language. And that is super interesting in its own right. And I'm, you know, I'm very drawn to that uh, and helping people do that. And then I sort of used to also think about explaining things as a much more technical skill, if you like, around clarity. Um, but actually, of course, the two things are completely connected because one of the most effective ways you can help people understand the thing is to explain it in your own distinctive way and in your own distinctive voice. Um, so much more, I find the two things and the two bits of work are interconnected. You started with the, that quote, um, that great communication is a dance between clarity and surprise, which yes. um, I've been telling people for years was a quote by uh, Dr. Steven Pinker uh, or Professor Steven Pinker, which I was convinced I'd read in one of his books. Um, that was based on, you know, research about what makes effective communication stick, is you need to understand uh, what you're being told, and then it needs to be a bit unexpected uh, so that it sticks. Uh, and I went back and I checked, because I knew we were going to be talking about this, and it turns out he didn't say it at all. I said it. <laughs> and I'd written it in the margin of one of his books. Um, which is like presents me with this dilemma, right? Because to quote Steven Pinker makes it feel like a proper idea. Like to quote myself just makes me sound a bit pretentious. <laughs> but I do think it's true. And it's a dance because it's not a science. It's not an equal balance of clarity and surprise. You know, it is a dance. It's constantly moving. Sometimes you're going this way. Sometimes you're going that way. It all depends on reading your partner very closely. Um, you know, sometimes it needs a lot of clarity and a little bit of surprise. Sometimes it's mostly surprise with, you know, just a bit of clarity. Um, and I just think that whole, what I particularly like about tone of voice is it is a way of focusing sort of softly, if you like, on the bits of communication that are outside of metrics and data. You know, we live in a communications world where every, you know, every headline is tested online for its efficacy. You know, how many clicks does it get? You know, what are the viewing statistics? There's a lot of communication that we can measure very precisely. And that is all well and good, but it traps us in a certain world. And there is something about taking seriously the idea that uh, tone has an effect that you can't measure in any one single metric. 
that tunes us back into something that we instinctively know is really true about communication and really profound, but that we we tend to undervalue it because it's not so easily measurable. Now I've heard about tone in uh, in when uh, they coach speakers, right? They say your tone of voice, how you modulate your voice as you talk is really important. But a lot of the tone uh, of voice, uh, it's in the tone of your newsletter that you talk about is actually written tone of voice. So how can brands or businesses or individuals learn to recognize their own tone and translate that into the written form so it's it is really true isn't it and it's ironic for um you know given that what we're doing is focusing on how effectively we communicate that we then use this weird bit of jargon tone of voice which is instantly slightly confusing because we're not talking about spoken voice we're talking about written voice so i think what What I am talking about and what sort of brand, the brand world in general has come to settle on is the idea that when you talk about tone of voice or brand voice, you're talking about how that comes across in writing. And that is simply because writing has become the dominant way that brands communicate uh, in a digital world. You know, there's loads of stuff that is on video. There's still plenty of stuff that's in print. But the words that we are producing en masse are written, you know, because we're doing it on various different social media platforms because it's easy to produce websites and get digital stuff out there. Um, And I think what's interesting about it um, or the challenge or the problem that we need to solve is that lots of our instincts about writing are quite conservative with a small c, you know, that... um, we are like we'll instinctively I'm just thinking about lots of my clients where you know we'll instinctively be very happy to uh, create a new cutting edge app or have a you know a, a really cool or radical photography style or new typefaces or like that side of brand and design they're very happy to push but if you tell them they should start a sentence with and um, or to write more conversationally, that still feels like, you know, that's a challenge to how many of us were uh, taught to write, you know. And a lot of that is changing, particularly in the business world. I mean, God knows, 10 years ago, most workshops I ran ended in <laughs> or contained some kind of argument about whether it was professional to be conversational or did you need to be formal? And like largely that very tedious argument is over. Um, But we're still much more conservative about the way we write than about the way we do lots of other things. So it's important to take it seriously and think consciously about what we sound like in our writing and how we get our personality into writing, Um, because otherwise we'll end up defaulting uh, just to sounding a bit bland or a little bit corporate or a little bit cheesy or, you know, whatever the kind of default modes are for writing for businesses. So what's the value of um, writing more conversationally and becoming a little bit more comfortable uh, experimenting with writing? Um well, like everything to do with brand and marketing, like the more distinctive and interesting that you are, the better. Like life is too short to be a dull copycat of anybody else. Like, you know, why would you want to do it? Um, so just finding your thing and your mojo, your voice uh, is does it. In fact, so it's two parts, isn't it? It doesn't just help you stand out. Uh, It's that when you find your voice, you find all sorts of other things as well. Like as soon as you find your natural way to be, you start, it also helps you think of the things you want to say. It helps you, you know, if you're funny, being funnier suddenly helps you explain things better because you have a natural way with a certain type of metaphor, say. Or, you know, as soon as you start being really conversational, you become much warmer and you connect with your customers more. Like if it's really true for you and your brand, it's just like a sort of force multiplier uh, it's like turning up all the the turbo charges, whatever the metaphor is. Whereas, you know, trying to work in somebody else's voice 
is just like trying to play with hard mode on. Like it's just like it's just a grind. It's amazing how often I work with clients who uh, they know perfectly well what their voice should be. They have a voice that comes perfectly naturally, but for some reason or another, they don't think they're allowed to be like funny or um, bold or whatever it is that they're like. Doesn't it feels it feels a risk? It can feel a risk, but as soon as they do it. Like of course that by being really comfortable, um, everything else just sort of comes much easier. Can you give me an example or two, like uh, brands that may be considered in a similar category or in a similar world that have found their mojo or their voice, so to speak? So if I think about the people I've written about in Tone Knob, for instance. There is uh, Lemon IO, who are a recruitment company to all intents and purposes, who help match up startups with developers like coders and you know techies and uh, programmers. Um, and their website has this completely mad Dungeons and Dragons really over-the-top, fire-and-brimstone religious voice. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt this. Um, Everyone else is talking the language of recruitment. They're talking the language of developers mucking about. And then they've just transformed the whole recruitment process into a sort of, like, quest-type language, which just makes everything feel really cool. It's very flattering to the developers uh, because it's a very in-joke. It means that they can talk about what is essentially quite boring process stuff, about, you know, you'll have to go through a three-stage interview and you'll fill in these forms. Like, they've given it this exciting language of of quest. Um, It just, like, just makes the whole thing really sing and is just super interesting it gets them loads of coverage and just everything and then there is um a scientific instruments company uh called unchained labs and they so the scientific instruments world as you can probably imagine is very sciencey like the language is very technical they do like you know particle analyzers this is real like you know serious nanotechnology type stuff all of their other competitors are talking science to other scientists um, and the language is very precise. And that whole industry, without really realising it, um, is writing the language of science reports. That's how they've absorbed this incredibly dry, very objective, passive language. Um, Unchained labs talk like they're surfer dudes. You know, this... Uh, this uh, particle analyzer will totally rock your samples. Like all of their um, instruments have names. They've given them personalities like Big Kahuna, Big Kahuna, Tuna. Um, I'm trying to think about all the other names. Every single name has the letters UN in it. So the UN of Unchained in these things. So their machines that sit in these laboratories have personalities. Um, most of their competitors seem to be very uh, scornful about this, that it's not serious, it's not professional, but it makes them hugely stand out, gets them talked about. Uh, lots of people I spoke to in the industry want to go and work for them. Like, it's just an absolute magnet. Again, it's like amplifying their effect. I remember I was uh, one of the issue of Turn On. I was impressed with your takedown of the CIA website because of the way it sounded. And you said that was the most serious <laughs> tone of voice you yeah. had come across. So again, and the, like the CIA website is super fascinating because, of course, so they used to have a really bureaucratic government website that talked in the language of bureaucracy. Um, and then they sort of sharpened it up because, of course, like the main, you know, obviously you're not going to the CIA website to learn about how they do secret operations. You're going there. It's largely a recruitment thing. And they just make it sound really cool by being really, really serious. It occurred to me that it is the language that 
corporate speak thinks it sounds like, you know, it thinks it sounds really serious and important, but it's not. But when you're the CIA and you are literally, you know, dropping black ops operatives into secret locations and all of that stuff and doing real spying, uh, you can make it sound really momentous and epic and get away with it. And it's sort of outrageously over the top in a way. And it makes you realise like there's no jokes, no jokes, no humour, no warmth, no nothing, none of that at all. And uh, it properly sort of gives you chills. Um, I just say, again, that's really interesting. So I mean, I think we tend to think of the idea of tone of voice being around, being friendlier, more chatty, funnier. Like the CIA have picked this really austere voice that if you are the sort of person who is thinking about working for you know, the CIA, it would make you like, go, yeah, actually, that sounds really exciting. I want to be part of that. It's very high status, quite minimalist, very austere. Yeah. So partly there's a thing about the opportunity that an organisation or a brand has is to speak as a as a thing, not as individuals. So what you're getting in spooks is like characters, the actual, you know, spies having their personality and their banter, which the CIA has decided not to draw on, you know, that. It's not using the personalities of its people to bring life. It is speaking as this sort of monolithic organisation. I just thought it would be worth looking at that. We are the nation's first line of defence. We accomplish what others cannot accomplish and go where others cannot go. A career at the CIA is unlike any other. We're looking for people from all backgrounds and all walks of life to carry out the work of a nation. Like that, the work of a nation. It's like, it's hugely it's potential. So heavy. Yeah. Like, but if you're the CIA, you can get away with that. Like, and like all the branding, like it's all black and white, very minimalist type, you know, no friendly pictures. And then there was that bit where um, I found a, an old bit of how they used to talk, which was much warmer and more conversational. Um, so they're talking about the CIA seal, which is the, you know, the thing with the eagle and the thingy. And they used to say, uh, the CIA is one of the most recognisable images in the world. You've probably seen it on book covers, T-shirts and in the movies. But what's the meaning behind the seal? Where does it represent? What does it represent to the CIA? It's employees and the US citizens we serve. Like it's quite chatty and friendly. Now they're just like the CIA symbol, an eagle for alertness, a shield for defence, a compass rose for global intelligence collection. Like, <laughs> I sort of love it. It's Done. so brutal. It's so brutal. Um, now, I want to take you from, from this seriousness to the other end of the spectrum. Uh, you used to be a joke writer for the radio. Yes. And uh, you also did some cartooning. So, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, British uh, television is also famous for its sense of humor as the BBC America tells us. Yes. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the role of you know, having a sense of humor and injecting a sense of humor and how that can you know, sort of contribute value to the message that you are trying to get across when uh, you, know, you would think that you want to be serious, but in fact, a sense of humor might work better. Yeah, so I have a couple of things to say on that. Firstly, let's all agree that humour done badly or, you know, lazy jokes, cheesy puns, trying to be funny for the sake of it, that's just rubbish. That doesn't doesn't work. It impresses nobody. We all roll our eyes and, oh, God. You know, and for there was a time, you know, it's very common to talk about brands like Innocent Drinks who sort of led the way with the idea of tone of voice. And also, unfortunately, there were lots of copycat brands who just sort of thought, oh, all right, well, we have to be funny then and cutesy and whimsical, and incredibly irritating when, you know, every crisp packet you picked up was trying to be your best friend. And it was just like incredibly infantilizing. Um, so like if we put that aside and go, if uh, using humour is going to like, if it's relevant for you, and it's relevant, you know, more often than not. Um, partly, like, humour done well is a demonstration of seriousness, because to be funny, you have to understand your idea well enough to give it that extra turn, 
you know, to find the unexpected angle, to, I, there's a lovely phrase of it, you know, you don't, you don't really understand the thing until you can find the metaphor to explain it. And often humour is about, you know, finding a metaphorical way in. So there is a thing about, like, if you can be funny or witty about a thing, you are demonstrating that you really know your stuff. Like, that is just a very simple thing for me, you know, in a very basic way. The Economist's famous ads are about showing, you know, they're, they're not just saying, you know, really clever and intelligent people read us. They're showing that they're really, really clever because they're brilliant jokes. Like, they're very, very sharp. Um, and so there is, like, that, it is harder to be funny than it is to be serious, and so if you're f funny and you do it well, people get that you are good at something. Like either you are, you know, if you're a small brand, it's a demonstration that the people who literally work there, your small team, are uh, sharp and good. And so that transfers directly to well, the quality of the product or the quality of the insight or the, whatever it is. If you're a larger brand, it shows you understand that there is a value in spending money on having good agencies who create good advertising or whatever it is. So it's like it's a measure of uh, uh, that sort of conspicuous effort, if you like, and a measure of getting it. It's also literally just a very good way of helping people get stuff and remember stuff. Like we remember funny stuff, then we tell our friends, you know, and then we go, oh, have you seen that ad? And you share it. So there's like this sort of viral thing. And then I just think, quite apart from all of that, which is like, you know, the sort of intangible value of humour in its own right, uh, is that thinking, like as a writer and as a communicator, thinking in terms of, humor structures is just a super useful tool like i so i you know the first things that i ever wrote in my career were jokes and most of what i write now isn't funny but i still think of the structure the same way that if you are pacing a joke to deliver a punch line you instinctively have to get those beats exactly right so that your listener or your reader has exactly the right amount of information at exactly the right time to go on to the next bit and the next bit. And then when your punchline lands, they've got everything they need to find it as funny as possible. And that is very, like the nuances of that are very, very subtle. You know, half a beat here, one syllable there, this word over that word, you know, Victoria Wood, Victoria Wood, the British comedian always talks about, you know, uh, a chocolate bourbon is funnier than a biscuit. Right? Just giving the name of a particular biscuit, like every little nuance has to be right, the beats have to be right, and then your punchline lands. And like, it, was, I, it was surprising to me that other copywriters didn't think in the same way, actually, because I think like, then, you're, then everything earns its place. If you're using a joke structure or a, a similar sort of format, um, yeah. So there's the sort of like there's the external value of humour, and then there's a sort of internal machinery structure of if you're always thinking about how to land a joke, you're going to be sharpening your comms in really useful ways. Now this this whole thing about the structure, which is super fascinating, uh, brings me to your product. You um, did a lot of research and through your work and examples and collaborating with others you've uh, uh, come up with a voice box, what you call, uh, which is, can you tell me what it is? Yeah, so voice box is a method for helping brands or people working with brands like copywriters or agencies or strategists uh, to help define a brand's tone of voice. And this came from a few years ago when I, I left working in a creative agency and set up for myself um, realizing that lots of people still found like found the idea of tone of voice a little bit intimidating or just fuzzy and vague and didn't have a didn't have a process for thinking about it. Um, so it just felt useful to me to see if there was a model to you know tone of voice. The, the idea of tone of voice has only been around sort of maybe twenty years as a sort of brand thing. Um, but nobody had properly done any sort of 
like methodology. methodology. Um, so I sort of thought actually it would be useful if there is a sort of model we can use. So we've got a common language to talk about it. It'll help people see it as not quite so vague and fluffy and then package it all up so that people can do it themselves. So that's what it is. At the heart of it, um, I am saying that there are 11 what I call primary voices. There are 11 distinctive brand voices. Um, so things like the energizer, super energetic voice, the fire starter, really spiky, in-your-face, provocative voice, uh, right at the other end, the simplifier, the neutralizer, the straight talker. So I'm saying there are 11 different uh, distinctive types. They're not quite archetypes in the kind of sense that often the brand world uses like Jungian archetypes or, you know, hero's journey type archetypes. They're more like distinctive styles of writing that you can group together. Um, and what I have found is that uh, that is super helpful to people uh, because all of a sudden being able to see that the whole landscape can be chopped up into these 11 voices and you can point at them and go, oh, like we're mainly that one with a little bit of that one uh, is really helpful. Uh, to start with, I was really at pains to say, there aren't really 11 voices. I've just made this up. Um, but nobody cares. Like, it's super useful. It's a, like, you know, the George Box, the statistician, uh, says that all, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Are useful, uh, yes. Yeah, so I sort of feel that about it. Like, um, I've made it up. 11 is right. It's enough detail for things to be specific, but it's not overwhelming. Um, and it's just a very useful way of um, managing the world. And then... Alongside that, there's lots of other tools and games to run workshops to help a brand sort of distill and find its voice. And then just lots of practical writing guidance to go, OK, so we are an energizer voice with a little bit of uh, playful child. How do we what does that look like? How do we write that? How do we turn it into guidelines for a brand? How do we apply it in the world? So it's all of that boxed up. So it's about combining. Now, I'm, as I'm listening to you, I'm wondering if I don't have a brand or I don't think about uh, companies or institutions uh, with the idea of brand, but I'm still head, heading an organization and wanting to communicate through it. So an institution, a nonprofit, you know, a type of organization, whether they think about it as brand or not, they want to be the most effective. And, and so, you know, how, how do they start to synthesize the kind of characteristics that make them who they are, make them tick, and then, you know, convey them into their communication? That's a good question. And in fact, uh, there was a, a university bought a couple of voice boxes to use in their leadership program to help their leaders find their own personal voice. And when they did this, I was like, no, you're mad. It's not what it's for. It's for brands. If I was inventing it for people, I might have started somewhere else. And they found that that worked really, really well, actually, to use the, the primary voices for individuals to help them find their own voice. And so actually, I think it is, it is just a tool, really, to help you find a voice that you are, that is effective and comfortable for you. And that, so you can take the idea of brand quite loosely, as it might literally be a business or an organisation or a product or a campaign, or it might be, yeah, my individual personal style as a leader. Like, it could easily be that. Um, or any sort of anywhere in between. My department... Uh, has that department sound or, you know, we're communicating a big change program. What's the voice of the communicating the change program? So you can sort of, you could draw a little, you know, board around any kind of like communication error and go, okay, so let's think about, let's think consciously about the voice of this. So that's instantly broadened the potential market for voice box, which is excellent. <laughs> Now you've written a book about uh, writing on writing or not reading rather. Yes. Uh, how important is reading to writing? 
Uh, oh God, it's sort of everything, really. I mean, writing is one of those big skill, like it's a big lifetime skill. Uh, and, you know, I still feel like I am in many ways just starting out as a writer. I've been writing professionally for 25 years um, and I'm still learning. And the like the most effective way that you learn, I think, as a writer is just by reading lots and lots and lots and lots of very different stuff, you know, so. Um, what are the kind of things you read? So, well, what am I reading at the moment? I'm reading... Um, so I've been reading some poetry with my kids. I've been reading a Japanese essay about interior design written in the 1940s. That's amazing. In praise of shadows. Uh, like, you know, articles in magazines online. Like with lots, There's lots of different voices as well as fiction. I've always got a couple of business books on the go. I try and read stuff that is you know, science or evolutionary biology or just weird, like not like far away from my field or specialism. Uh, loads of humour, just like just a constant massive mix of stuff. Um, and I think part of the reason I wrote on reading was because through conversations with people about their reading habits, it became really clear that as adults, lots of people get stuck on that idea that I've started a book so I need to finish it before I can go on to the next book, which is an incredibly self-limiting idea. You know, life is short. There are many millions of words out there to read and you are not picking up the next book because you find the one you're reading now boring. That is madness. Like, put it down, go on to the next thing. And I, I like of treating reading much more like, you know, the ways we consume any other media. Like, you don't go onto Netflix and, like, only watch... You know, well, I'm going to watch all, it well, we might, all seven seasons of this thing before I allow myself to watch any other television at all. We sort of don't work like that. I must complete reading this website before I go on to the next one. Like, we don't do websites like that either. But books, start one, finish one. Um, so this constant stream of, you know, words and ideas and interesting language and some stuff you're reading for total pleasure some stuff you're reading for interest and education some stuff you're like not even reading like you know comics and art and photography books i've always got like trying to have something like that on the go which is again you read those at a different pace and what it means to read a page is completely different um on re so on reading is really just a collection of like ways of shaking up our assumptions about reading. Uh, there's a lovely technique from a friend of mine who um, was trying to read Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall and uh, her family were mocking her because it was taking her so long to read. And so she decided to embrace, really embrace slow reading. So she deliberately read one page a day. And that's amazing because suddenly you're really free then. That's what takes like three minutes. Um, you're free to do whatever else you want in life with your reading. But eventually she got through Wolf Hall and she read it in a way that was sort of more, she was more closely intertwined with it because of this unusual way of reading it and actually quicker to read a page a day and have read it in a year and a half than, I mean, how many books in your life are sitting on the bedside table that you haven't picked up for two years. Like, I know I've got loads of books that are in the back of my mind. I'll probably go back to that one day. I never will. So I feel like I can't even remember what your question was now. I'm sorry, I've just rambled. No, 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 this is good. We're going to stop here. Thank you again for joining us for this conversation on value. I'm your host, Valeria Maltoni, and I hope you'll join us again for our next conversation on Traces and Dreams. If you've enjoyed this episode, Please share it with your network and subscribe.